All right. So my name is Ashante Taylor Cox and welcome to the Power of Us Cultivating Safe Spaces for Marginalized Survivor Communities. I'm so happy to be here today with everyone. Uh, thank you everyone who has started to introduce yourself in the comments. Just would love to know your name and the type of provider that you are. Feel free throughout this presentation to take a break if you need it. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask questions throughout the presentation. And let's get started. So my goal for today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about You Are More Than Incorporated, what it looks like when navigating through a survivor's racial and LGBTQ plus identity development, showing up as an LGBTQ plus affirming provider and anti-racist provider, and then we will have a Q&A. So again, my name is Ashante. I am a licensed associate counselor here in the state of New Jersey, and I am the founder and executive director of You Are More Than. We are a nonprofit that is survivor led, and we aim to plant seeds of emotional well being, educational growth, and pathways to financial freedom for adult survivors of commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking. We have a unique focus because we work exclusively with BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities. And we envision creating a world where mental health, education, and financial stability are no longer barriers for access for survivors. We wanna see a world where survivors, particularly marginalized survivors, are seen, heard, and understood in their own lives, communities, and throughout a wider lens of society's views. We have three main programs, our Wellness Center, which is geared towards supporting survivors throughout the state of New Jersey and nationally by connecting them with mental health professionals who are long-term, have trauma-informed approaches and are able to support them for free to low cost. We help survivors get back into school by providing uh, funding to maintain in school, whether it be the grant funding goes to childcare, tuition, transportation, uh, whatever helps the survivor maintain in school. And then we have a social enterprise component where we directly invest in survivor-led small businesses and help survivors get back on their feet and become financially stable. So why survivors of color and LGBTQ folks? As a queer woman and a black woman and going through programs myself in, in like eight years ago, um, I noticed that there were not a lot of folks that look like me in leadership roles. And I also noticed that when we talk about sexual violence, when we talk about the commercial sex industry, a lot of folks will see, so like everyone will be represented as survivors of color, but there won't be a lot of programming that is focused on supporting us. And there's not a lot of programming that focuses on LGBTQ individuals. We have a very heteronormative approach to doing the work. And so we wanted to change that through YAMT. In 2017, Rights for Girls found that 40% of trafficking incidents across the United States were Black females, and 64% of adult prostitution arrests were Black women, and 57% of all juvenile prostitution arrests were Black children. So a large proportion of the commercial sex industry is making up marginalized, particularly Black and Brown survivors, but a lot of support that is out there is not very catered to a Black and Brown survivor. And when you look at youth who are between 18 to 24 of color and, and sexual, sexual gender minority youth, they have been overrepresented in the homeless youth population. And for the most part, they are more active in engaging in survival sex than their white counterparts um, in order to survive. And alarmingly high rates of indigenous women and girls have gone missing in the United States since 2010. And many have reported experiences of exploitation and trafficking, but I can count on my hand how frequent people actually acknowledge indigenous women and girls and the organizations that are out there to support them will, will predominantly receive less funding than white counterpart organizations. So when we look at, you know, why, why does racial trauma matter? Why do I need to acknowledge this when I'm acknowledging sexual violence? 
because it's de directly intersecting. I can't take off of I can't take off the color of my skin. Um, automatically, if I walk out into the world, you wouldn't necessarily know that I'm a queer woman, but my identities intersect. So being able to understand that the impacts of racial trauma and sexual violence is really, really important. So what is racial trauma? It's the cumulative effects of racism on someone's mental and physical well-being. So this can be direct acts of racism, hate crimes, discrimination, systems of systemic racism, which we'll look at a little bit later, microaggressions, threat of harm or injury due to your particular race, witnessing killings of people of color, um, police brutality, and other traumatic events. Last year throughout quarantine, one thing that was very shocking to, to me as I'm going through private practice work and working in the community with um, other folks was noticing how a lot of providers in the community didn't know how to address racial trauma and or felt that that was a separate issue than whatever issue the client was coming to your organization for your private practice for. And that was alarming because we were going through a lot of protests. Um, black and brown folks, it, when we see folks being killed on, on the computer screen on your TV, um, it has kind of become the norm that we just watch these things happening over and over again and people not really acknowledging the the stress and turmoil that it can take on your body from watching all of those things so this is what racial trauma is and it's really important again to acknowledge that you need to be able to hold space for both of our intersectional identities when we think about the implications of going up black and brown, and as specific as it relates to sexual violence and trafficking, trafficking is the oldest oppression form in this country. It began uh, during colonization of black women and girls and of indigenous women, and it continues to perpetuate throughout our society today. Black slaves, specifically women, were commonly known as Jezebels. They were exotic sexual objects often um, known as sexually deviant and deserving of trauma and, and abuse. And oftentimes, sometimes people still have that perception today, especially when you go and report your experiences of sexual violence. Well, you know, it's more common for folks to think I'm more deserving of my trauma and abuse than a, a non-person of color. And that, that I'm more common to be promiscuous. I'm more common to be, um, exotic in nature if you were to have be intimate with me. So these implications are something that are still carried throughout this current time in 2021. Stereotypes play a large role in how survivors of color are perceived within the sexual violence field within the commercial sex industry. African American women are often seen as immoral or hypersexualized. Asian women are seen as obedient and submissive as it relates to engaging with them in domestic labor or sex work. Latina women are seen as exotic and submissive. Not Native American women are seen as uncivilized. So all of these stereotypes impact, impact the way that folks see us through our communities. And it's hard because it's like during slavery, young women and girls were sold to white male enslavers and labeled as fancy girls. Men were often seen at the time as treating girls within their nature and not held accountable for the abuse that they caused. And that continues to happen today. The trope continues today when individuals of sexual violence, individuals who buy sex um, are often seen as more of a bystander and innocent in a survivor's life, rather than someone being held accountable for the abuse and trauma that they inflict on girls and, and women. And, specifically black and brown folks, as we saw in the statistics before, are often criminalized and further marginalized for their experiences of trauma rather than being supported and uplifted. In, in 2018, 40% of missing persons were people of color, but yet African Americans only make up a 13% of the population. And this, for me, hit very deep um, very deep to me this this past summer when my friend was murdered and the only reason that her her story was brought to attention was brought to media portrayal as an Asian American woman was because there was a large case in, in the news um, for Gabby Petito and 
that made the internet say, hey, what about all the missing black and brown folks that are going missing and no one's talking about? What about people of color that frequently go missing on a daily basis? Where are their stories? Where are their news coverage? Where is the um, support that they need in order to get their cases solved? And it, it was very apparent that there aren't enough resources there. There are organizations strictly dedicated to being able to uplift black and brown um, experiences of missing persons in order to help get our stories out there. So taking this into context again, that like we're not being seen, there's no equality there. And so if there's no equality there, there's no safety there. We can't build from safety if there isn't any equality there in, in terms of getting support. Missing African-American women are seen as, they're often seen as um, runaways rather than missing. I used to work in a group home setting with um, young women and girls. And oftentimes within that setting, if any time our girls went missing, the police would come and they would be helpful sometimes. Most of the time they would say, oh, she just ran away, she'll come back. And if she ran away for a really long period of time, it would be like, okay, we, we can't do anything. She's just a runaway. You can't really do anything. And her file from her other group home setting, she's a runaway. You, we, we just have to accept her as being AWOL and not really being able to support her in that moment of recognizing, well, why is she running away? What, what is happening um, outside of the home? We had one youth who would run away because she wanted to be with her birth family. And it's like, you don't have to run away you can make a pass to go see them um, because this only perpetuates the narrative that if you, if there's something bad happens to you for real and you go out into the world and people do not acknowledge you because they're like, oh, well, I read your file, you're a runaway. It, it doesn't support you. So adults are also seen as being criminally involved and not really experiencing sexual violence. Like there's a, there's a lot of narrative of, I need to question you and I need to make you feel like you're the criminal rather than actually supporting you. And then folks that are living in impoverished, impoverished and criminal ridden communities are often, often seen as, oh, that's just a part of your life. Uh, you experiencing violence, you experiencing difficulties with feeling safe is just a part of your life. So I'm not really gonna acknowledge it. I don't really have to acknowledge it. Like yesterday I came to your house, doesn't really matter. Um, so being, being aware that there's a lot of biases that exist within our world that are just inherent that continue to be perpetuated throughout our society. And it's up to us to be able to change that. I am going to share a quick video so that you can learn a little bit more about how um, folks um, talk to their children when it comes to going out into the world, especially as a black and brown person. But before that, to give you some context, when it looks, when we look at our program, without, within YAMT, we have about uh, 100 members. 40% of those members identify as Caucasian or white, and then 37% identify as African American, 3% as Asian specific Islander Desi American, 3% as biracial and 12% as Latinx. And so a lot of our community members make up black and brown individuals. I'm gonna have to reshare my screen so that you can see the video. One second. Dear child. Dear child. Dear child. The reason we have to have this talk is because you are a black child in America. I need you to know that, and there's so many things going on in the world. I won't lie to you, you're going to see some things that are going to break you down, it's going to hurt. I know how hard it is for you to see yourself in the place of Tamir Rice. So I need you to always be prepared and always be on your guard and it takes away from you being a little kid, I know, but I'm trying to protect you right now. If you are approached by police. Just stay calm. Don't fight back, don't give any rebuttals. You have to understand, if you want to stay alive, you have to 
do what they say. Because it could be the difference between me seeing you again and not seeing you again. Sad to say, sometimes it may not even work. I'm just gonna be honest. It may not work at all. Um, I'm sorry. I know it's tough. And I know it sounds really scary, but it's not your fault. We live in a society that is geared that we do not succeed. It is put together, it is constructed in such a way that we fail. And you have to be greater than all of that. Always stand with your head up and your shoulders back and be proud and you are a warrior. Always know that you are intelligent, beautiful, bright, and you have a future. You have inherent worth in this society. And above all else, you're my son. Regardless of what happens, because I don't know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, whatever, just don't change. Don't change and be proud of who you are. I love you with all that I am. I will teach you how to walk in this life. You don't have anything to be afraid of. We'll get through this, and don't you ever, ever, ever blame yourself for what others do. I love you, I believe in you, and I believe that others just like you, who hold on to their light, together, you all will change the world. Hi everybody. Sorry about that. We're just I'm just coming on. Miss Kitty, can you stand back a little bit? Some of your signs are a little too low uh, on the screen and some folks are having a hard time. So I think if you step back, um, it will help. Sorry for the interruption. Otherwise, we're all good. That sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So if we could take two seconds to type in the chat box, what are your um, overall reactions from the video? And it's so hard because I wish I could see everybody's faces because when I do this training in a, in a smaller setting, I, and I'm primarily working with folks who are black and brown, I ask how many of you all have had this talk? And most of the room will raise their hand and say like, I've had this talk. And it may not be in that capacity of like your parent really sitting you down and, and, and having it in that full capacity. It may be the experience of going to school one day when you're a middle schooler and, and I'm gonna relate this back to me and having your teacher pull you out of school every day in fifth, in fifth period for social studies because she said that your outfit was inappropriate but I was wearing the same outfit as all of my friends. I went to predominantly white institution when I was growing up, but I was one of the individuals in my school who, it was five of us who were black and brown, whether it be black, um, Latina, um, Asian American, and we all developed differently than our white counterparts, but we were often discriminated against in the school setting. And so the way my mother had that talk with me was to say, you are not the same as them. You cannot wear the same clothes as them. You cannot act the same as them because that will put you in more danger. That will get you suspended from school or, or kicked out of school or um, targeted by your teachers. So you have to recognize that you are not the same. And so in that video, right? Like sometimes it can be a very like, not, not saying like lovey-dovey as like a term of, it can be very like, empowering talk and, and also heartbreaking talk, or it can be a very straightforward talk of, you're not the same, don't act like them, um, because it will put you in a different situation. Thank you everybody for writing in the, in the box. Um, you know, a lot of people saying that, you know, this is the truth, it speaks the truth. Um, a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, um, feeling like it has hit home for you. So thank you so much for sharing. So as we look at the identity development of 
a black or brown person. And right, I'm an African-American woman. I'm gonna speak from my experiences as in a woman of color. I do not represent all women of color. This identity development is based off of the folks that I've worked with and including myself, but some of the things that we often experience. So the idea from birth to five years old, I first learned what colorism was and experienced medical neglect. I've, I've worked with a lot of women who will go into the hospital setting and experience um, violence when they're having a baby because they're not treated the same as their white counterparts when they go into that setting. I learned that in elementary school that my body was an object rather than something that actually belonged to me. Beyond sexual abuse, I began to learn that what it meant when everybody else started seeing me as an adult because my body type rather than just a kid. If I am developing faster than the children around me, um, or if I'm taller, if I'm a young man and I look very tall for my age, but I'm actually 10. My brother, when he was growing up, he was 10 years old and was like five, seven. And so people often thought that he was older, but he's 10. And so people no longer see him as a kid. They see him as a young man. They see him as an adult. Example, Tamir Rice being um, murdered. He was seen as an adult when he was just playing in a playground. Um, middle school, I learned that it was okay to be sexualized in private by my predominantly white peers, but it was gross in public because I'm Black. I've had a, a man say to me, well, he was a child. A child say to me, <laughs> we dated for five minutes, y'all very gay woman, didn't know it in middle school, knew when I was like 12, but like didn't know it. I was trying to figure out my life. So he says, oh, we, we were boyfriend and girlfriend for one day. The next day he came to school, he was standing at his locker and he said, I can't date you anymore. And I said, why? And he said, you know why? My mom doesn't like black people. Y'all, I'm 30. I was shook. I was like, oh, okay. I guess we broke up. We broke up that same day. And so it's just like, acknowledging we have to learn about race and learn about these dynamics at a very early age, at a very early age. And we have to not necessarily internalize them, but we have to learn how to navigate the world with knowing that we may be treated differently because of the color of our skin. High school, I learned that no matter how hard my mom or my brothers work, police would still pull a gun on them in a heartbeat. I've, I've had family members who have been a police officer and in their regular clothes, working on their day off, driving and have had guns pulled on them. And then as soon as they realize that my brother is a police officer, they're like, oh, I made a mistake. Um, young adulthood, I learned that the way people have viewed me starts to become a box. Like that's something that I can be checked off of rather than seeing me as a hardworking individual. And now sometimes that may look different for different people, right? You as an individual are very hardworking. You go to school, you get into the best school that you, you can find and you have worked your whole life to get into that school or you've worked your whole life to get into that job. And then someone will, will, may come along and say, oh, you only got the job because you don't look around, you're the only black person here. You're the only Asian person here. You, you got this because you're a person of color, that's it. And like really demoting us to just that check off box. Adulthood, I learned how to be quieter in office spaces, how to shift my tone and my body language to make my white colleagues feel less threatened or uncomfortable. And when you get older, 65 and up, I see racial trauma, sexual trauma, physical trauma for some families being passed down from generation into generation. And it's very hard for me to know how to stop it, how to change it. And when we look at the identity development as, as an LGBTQ plus individual and coming into that context, right? People, this will impact people at a different stage. Some folks are able to know at a very early age that they're LGBTQ. We begin to learn about gender when we're about, we, we have a narrative about gender when we're three years old, especially when we go into a classroom setting like daycare, things of that nature and stereotypes are placed on us um, by the way that we look on the outside. So depending on how old the child is and, and where they're coming into their, their gender identity and their sexual orientation, it differs. That's why there's not words for the chart on how it, it works for LGBTQ plus individuals. But to give you some context, this can look like 
I'm learning that I'm LGBTQ and I'm in, um, I'm in middle school and I'm being bullied because now everyone um, thinks that I'm gay and that, and now they make fun of me every day and I'm really bullied. And now I'm feeling really outside. I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm not feeling supported. Um, maybe my family is not very supportive of me because of my identity. Um, maybe I'm going through high school and people out me because they think that it's funny, um, you know, or, you know, I go off to college and that's the first time that I'm able to be free and, and actually have the space to explore my identity. And I'm still experiencing trauma in that space. Um, constantly grappling with, you know, how do I navigate this world while keeping myself safe and also being my authentic self. And this, we can have a whole nother training on what it feels like for folks to go through throughout the world um, as an individual that may identify as trans. And I, and I encourage you to have those, those trainings specifically with trans folks. I'm a cisgender individual, um, but having those trainings with trans folks to understand the narrative and the complexities of what it can look like, not only going throughout the world with a different orientation, a sexual orientation that is not, um, normal to other people that is seen as different, but also going through the world knowing that, you know, I identify, I may identify as trans and I have to now go through the world with multiple pieces to my, my, my narrative. I have to go through the world of recognizing that people off the bat will not treat me right because of my gender identity. So to, we're gonna watch a, uh, we're going to go through a, a timeline of what this looks like and then watch another one more video. So childbirth. Uh, Black women are three to four times more likely to experience pregnancy-related deaths than white women. If trauma occurs in the home, this can be repeated throughout their lifetime. And if you're a clinician on the call, you know that birth trauma is real. You, you know that when we're in the womb and we experience uh, trauma, that that stays with us. I've worked with domestic violence survivors who, um, and this is always what breaks my heart sometimes is that, you know, I will work with someone and I'll be at a hospital with them trying to get them support. And we'll be, I remember us being on a phone call after um, their partner beat them up. Eight months pregnant, the partner beat them up. And I'm talking to the provider on the, the hotline call and they're like, and at the time when I was talking to this pro provider, they were like, you need to report. Uh, did you report your partner for you know hurting you? And she said, no, because what happens when I report him and I don't have anywhere else to go after reporting him? I don't have a house to go back to. Um, I can't go into emergency shelter because I don't feel comfortable with it. And I have more kids than the one that's in my belly. Um, I directly rely on this partner in order to uh, get what I need to get my needs met. I, I do not have the, the capacity to report him because then I'm putting myself in a worse um, situation than I was before he beat me up. I just need to, you know, see what other resources that you can have that you have for me. And at that time, that person wasn't able to get the resources that they need because they didn't report or and the staff um, at the hospital didn't take them seriously because they said, well, if you didn't report it, like all we can do is like bandage you up and send you home. That hospital staff were not trauma informed and they were not trauma informed when that woman gave birth. They weren't trauma informed when she came back again the next year and was even more severely harmed. So being mindful that like whatever intersectionality, whatever way that you're interacting with survivors, of trauma within your um, job, it matters. Whether you're a hospital setting person, whether you're a social worker, whether you're a, ca a case manager, you're a legal person, it matters. Um, school to prison pipeline, children begin to understand the disparities that occur within the school setting and outside world. And color is no longer represented by a crown in a box. If I start suspending a child um, right off the bat in elementary school for behavioral issues, and that is all they know. They go throughout their entire school setting being suspended, being expelled um, because they're hyperactive, because they got into a fight and no one's really addressing the fact that all of these things are happening to them. I had one youth that I've worked with for years where they were experiencing sexual violence at home every day. 
And so they were failing. And instead of the school addressing the, the sexual violence that they were experiencing or helping in any way in terms of that matter, they said, oh, she can't come to school anymore. She's not able to focus on her grades. We can't really help her. And it's like, Yes, everyone has their lane and that's really important. But as a collective, if we're able to work together and recognize that like our kids have lives outside of the school setting, our kids have traumas outside of the school setting that we may never know about or we may know about. And how can we help in the lane that we're in? How can we support them? So if I'm a school teacher and I'm recognizing, hey, my my child is failing because they have a lot of stuff going on at home. Have I done the necessary reports to make sure that like DCPMP is involved to make sure that they're safe? Have I done my part as a teacher, which teachers praise y'all if, you're, if anyone else is on this call. I used to be a music teacher before I was a clinician. Bless your heart because being a teacher is hard. But how else can I support them? Can I give them extra tutoring after school so that, um, or set them up with a tutor so that they, they don't automatically have to go home? Can I help them um, get in contact with the school social worker? What can I do for my part, for my job in order to best support them? middle school, Black children begin to develop physically and may look different than their white peers, which we talked a lot about a little bit earlier. They begin to be seen as older than they look and are treated as such. Many reports of police brutality, brutality towards younger African-American children, particularly African-American girls, happen around the ages of eight to 10 years old. So that's very, very young, high school. Children understand that they have to move and go through the world differently. They are viewed as adults, adults regardless of their actual age. Simple acts of walking down the street, listening to music, driving a vehicle, putting children in, put the children in their age group at risk for targeted violence. And across the board, again, as we look at like being LGBTQ, this can vary for a lot of folks. But if I'm navigating through the world with this identity and trying to figure out, well, how, how do I stay safe? If I'm not able to come out at my school because, um, you know, people are going to discriminate against me, people are going to tell me, people are going to misgender me every day. I, I work with a lot of folks who are like, Ashanti, I just do not understand pronouns. I do not understand how children at this specific age can make a decision about their gender identity or sexual orientation. And it's just like, it's not your job to necessarily understand that child's journey in the way that you're trying to conceptualize it in your mind. It's your job to support them. So if you forget that their pronouns today, because they can be fluid depending on the child, if you forget that their pronouns today are they, them, okay, cool, you forgot that their pronouns today are they, them, but let's call them by their name. You know, if their name is, is Omarion, call them Omarion. Do not call them Rachel because that is what you called them when they were five years old because you've had them in your elementary school forever. You call them Omarion. And then you practice, you practice learning how to utilize pronouns. You practice and understand what are my biases or walls that are coming up that are, are, making it hard for me to meet this child where they are at. Young adulthood is a time period when you're often trying to find yourself, understand yourself. How do I fit into this world? I'm not really a, an adult yet, but I'm no longer a kid. How do I make my own decisions now in a safe way? How do I reconcile and make sense of my either good or bad childhood? And where do I go from here? When I see teens come in because they have experienced sexual violence, you know, how do I fit into this world? If TikTok and Snapchat is my mode of communication with my friends, because I feel like Gen Zs do not have Facebook. Uh, a youth told me the other day that I'm a boomer. I said, oh girl. I'm only 30. I'm a millennial. Let's take it back. She was like, do you know what TikTok is? I have a TikTok. Don't play me. Um, you know, if my mode of communication is TikTok and, and Snapchat and the in Instagram and the folks on Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok all present in a way that is a little bit different than I am. How do I fit in? If I have been, um, if I am one way online, especially when I meet with youth who are, well, young adults who are in college, if I'm one way online where I'm like very cute, I have a Finsta, I like when people, I like to have ownership over my body, maybe I'll cute, take a little cute sexy pic here and there, but in person, I'm really not that way. I'm, I'm fitting in on an online world kind of context, but 
when I look at it from the perspective of like how I want to be treated, I don't want to be treated that way. And so sometimes when people come at me and then now I'm sexually assaulted because someone says to me, well, you took that sexy pic online. And so like you, you're asking for me to, to harm you. It's, it's very hard to figure out what, what do I do in this situation? I want to fit in. I want to be like my peers, but now I'm being taken advantage for being um, like my peers. How do I navigate the world? And then adulthood, settling into who you are and who you want to be while grappling with a world that isn't fair. You notice the disparities within your age group, but you have to keep going because you don't have a choice. The systems you interact with aren't necessarily built for you to succeed, so you need to create your own pathway. What does that look like for you? And then uh, families, and when we think about intergenerational trauma, some folks will reflect on when they get older, did I do the best for my family that I could possibly do? I, I've worked with a family whose grandmother, give you some context. I'm a third generational prostituted woman in my family. Every woman in my family and my geogram and my, and my family tree has experienced sexual violence in some form or manner. And it's like, what, what I noticed within in the family context is that like the intergenerational trauma is real. If I grow up and my, and my grandparents say to me every day, you know, well, you know, Ashante, if you didn't dress that way, you wouldn't have been assaulted. Or, you know, we have to protect the abusers in our family because they're family. Blood is thicker than water. You do not disarm this, this um, uh, you do not like let them go away because they're family. We have to keep the family together. And sometimes as you get older, you reflect on how did I, how did I keep my family safe? Did I live the life that I wanted? Um, did the cycles in my family continue to repeat themselves? And oftentimes within marginalized families, you will find that there are many cycles of abuse that have perpetuated throughout the, the individual's life. So as we think about intersexuality, intersectionalities, we wanna think about there are many identities that we will bring to the table. And it's important as service providers that we're able to hold space for all of those identities. So whether I'm an indigenous person and I am a two-spirit individual and I identify as a lesbian and you know, or, or I identify as queer and what is my identity when I present it to you? What is my identity when I present it to my family and my community? Um, how does intergenerational trauma impact my identity? Who is affirming in my life and who isn't? How does institutional violence impact me? How did I grow up? Who did I grow up around? And how does this impact me as a whole? So kind of taking these, these, these circles and, and intersecting them because this is what we're bringing to the table to you when we're sitting in front of you and, and asking for support. We're not gonna be this video because of time, but I encourage you to look into, look at YouTube, type in, and I'll send, I can send the link in the chat box, trans women talk about sexual assault. And it, it talks about the narratives of, of women who've experienced sexual assault, how they're viewed as trans women, and how it, it makes it difficult to gain support because of their gender identity. And this biopsychosocial model of minority stress framework, again, takes into consideration how do our different um, intersectionalities of, um, of our identities impact us and, and impact our health outcomes, impact the way that we um, go out into the world and gain support. So if we start with gender identity and combine that with our, our minority status, if we are LGBTQ, where I'm a cisgender female, um, my sexual identity is queer, um, and I have stigma against me, um, internalized um, homophobia maybe in the organization um, that I'm working with, internalized homophobia within myself. Um, I may struggle with substance use. I may struggle with depressive symptoms. How does all of these things impact me and impact my uh, capacity to get help? So when we think specifically about gaining assistance as an LGBTQ plus individual, dangers of outing yourself when seeking help and the risk of rejection from the provider sitting across from them, especially if you have isolation from your friends, family, and society. The lack of survivors not knowing if a service is LGBT specific or LGBTQ plus friendly, um, because a lot of times, sometimes 
institutions will not make that known. Um, potential homophobia from the staff of service providers are from non-LGBTQ plus survivors of intimate person partner violence. A lot of low confidence in the effectiveness of law enforcement in, in order to support LGBTQ plus people. And when I used to work in private practice, I was the individual who would take on all the domestic violence cases that were made up of LGBTQ plus relationships. And people will always be shocked, well, why doesn't the same sex partner hit the other partner back? And I'm like, why doesn't, if they're not same sex, don't hit their other partner back? Like we're making assumptions about a relationship because they're in a same sex relationship and not taking into consideration that we just need to show up and help them. That there doesn't need to be this wall or barrier to think that, well, it doesn't really happen in those relationships. It does. Um, lack of familiar community support leads to lack of resources for the client to lean on and fear of continuing to be victimized or criminalized further due, due to the laws and regulations placed throughout the United States that negatively impact us. So quick example, I used to be in a program um, gaining support for myself, my friend also gaining support for themselves. And at the time, my friend identified as a female, cisgender female. And then as they developed, they realized, you know, I'm not, I'm not cisgender. I am a trans male. And because now that I identify as a trans male, I no longer can gain assistance from that organization, even though I've experienced sexual violence. How heartbreaking is that? How heartbreaking is that there's a policy in place that say, you know, this is our lane. We only support survivors um, who are female presenting. And now, even though I've been supporting you for the last five years, I can no longer support you. So that can be a very large barrier of like, well, if I come out, maybe no one will support me anymore. Sometimes the systems meant to support us are the main ones who hurt us. When I would AWOL from my program, they just saw me as a throwaway rather than tapping into me needing more help. I was still a kid, even though my protective armor was to show you I'm grown and I can take care of myself. So survivors of color do not and will not have the same stories. We will not have the same narratives, but our roots of dehumanization and marginalization remain the same. We, we have these experiences of microaggressions that we have to learn how to navigate through throughout our entire lives. And so keeping that into consideration as you navigate with them in that room is really important. And this is a brief um, overview of different systems of care that a survivor may impact um, interact with you throughout your time with them, thinking about if I'm in my nuclear family, how does intergenerational trauma impact my, my family? How do I break the cycle? How do I help the survivor sitting in front of me break the cycle of sexual violence? Family systems, um, ending cycles of separation, I'm an adoptee, investing in community resources rather than automatically taking children away from their families, um, giving folks employment opportunities, collective community he healing to help families together, keep families together, supporting LGBTQ plus clients and building bonds with their chosen family members if their nuclear family isn't present, community systems, reinvesting back into BIPOC and LGBTQ specific communities, Schools are often the first points of entry for survivors of color to get the support they need prior to being further victimized. So if you're a school individual, if you work in the education system, recognizing that your role is so important. Medical professionals are often the second point of contact for survivors. And I, I regularly train um, survivor advocates and working with sexual violence um, survivors within hospital settings with accompaniments. And, there was a research study done in 2015 where medical providers would say that only 6% of their individuals identified as um, sexual violence trafficking survivors, and but 88% went through the hospital setting. So medical professionals, professionals also have a very, very unique and important role. Mental health systems, how can I create more empowering and supportive spaces for my clients to thrive emotionally. If I have one lane, if my job is to be the social worker for this um, residential program, and it's really great, we accept uh, youth that are female identifying, we accept maybe we have an adult program. Um, how am I making these spaces supportive? Am I taking away that heteronormative um, mindset that I have when supporting clients? Am I able to acknowledge racial trauma? How am I making these um, spaces supportive? 
employment, job accessibility for survivors of color and LGBTQ folks, policies and procedures that are reflect that reflect an inclusive and in trauma informed workplace, criminal justice system, shifting the structure of our justice system to create a fair and equal system for survivors of color and LGBTQ plus folks. Um, this may be controversial for some people, but defunding the police in a way that invests more resources back into marginalized communities. And then social services agencies. What about this system? And I love this question. What about my system, my social service agency that continues to make my cases come back? How can the system be improved to better serve the community rather than keeping them in this cycle of poverty? So some tips, bringing self-awareness, what difficulties do you face when it comes to addressing privilege and oppression when working with your clients? And reflect on that question. Take some time to, after this um, presentation, jot some things down. It's really difficult, to, difficult for me to address LGBTQ clients because I don't wanna say the wrong thing. Or as a white provider, it's really difficult for me to address um, white privilege, racial trauma, because I feel like, you know, again, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to make them feel worse. Like thinking about what, but become more self-aware of your own biases. So how do we show up as an anti-racist provider? Recognize that even if you grew up in the most liberal home with the most open and inclusive parents, you can still be racist. Taking one training a year that focuses on cultural and ethical considerations for clients isn't enough. This is a continued learning curve for providers in order to best serve marginalized communities. And similar to if we are black and brown folks who are serving the community, being able to take um, trainings that help us work with other black and brown folks, because there are things that we don't know about other cultures. Um, and it's important for us to be able to acknowledge those things, that we can still be biased and prejudiced to other cultures and that we need to be able to acknowledge that and be able to support them. African American folks specifically are socialized to learn how to assimilate to white culture. As black and brown cultures are learned to socialize, I'm speaking from the African American experience, but we learn how to dress, talk, walk, and live like the dominant culture in order to advance through the marginalization that we experience. When I was in private practice, white folks would not come to me because they felt like they could not relate. And over time, as I've grown in the private practice that I worked at, more folks would be like, oh, Ashanti's really skilled at sexual violence. I can see her. But oftentimes, my supervisor at the time that I had would be like, well, I don't get it. Why don't they come to you? I don't know, because they feel like they can't relate. But as people of color, we have to learn how to, group to relate. We learned from a very young age that we are not afforded the same opportunity as our white counterparts. And we often have to work 10 times harder in order to get to that level that our peers are at. Not seeing color is racist. So as providers, we have to learn that our clients' racial identities directly impact their, their victimization and is something that can't be erased. Our country was built on white supremacy. Sexual violence does the same thing. We have to be able to acknowledge those intersectional identities in order to best support our clients. Tangible tools that you can take today. Take a mental health inventory. How many folks of color do I see within my private practice agency or community agency? If I see none, why is that? And how can I make my services more accessible to them? If my majority of my community are minorities, am I being the best provider that I can be for them? And where can I improve when it comes to my understanding of best, how best to serve this population? Continue to get trained by fellow providers in the field that are folks of color who can expand your knowledge beyond the colonized materials that you learned in graduate school. And mental health and wellness should not only be accessible to the wealthy, there needs to be more accessibility to survivors of color. Read books that focus on survivor um, communities uh, that talk about their uh, sexual violence experiences. Girls Like Us was written by Rachel Lloyd, who is a white woman, but she, uh, GEMS is primarily made up of African-American girls. Um, and so, you know, taking time to read different books. We have 10 minutes left, y'all, we doing great. Um, call out racism within the workplace. It's not my job to point out if there are microaggressions happening to me, um, you know, as, white counterparts as white providers, it's, it's your job to be able to check your workplace uh, employees, your coworkers to be like, yo, dude, 
that was not okay that you said that in that meeting. Um, and thinking about as a whole, the policies and procedures that you have in place in order to support um, service providers that do identify from marginalized communities. Overall, you need to support your workers, but being able to say, what is my um, policy and procedures? Um, yes, I can add the books at the last, at, at the end of the chat, Tina. Go beyond performative activism. Social media or what you affirm on your website is a beautiful tool that unites people, but you need to do more than that. You posting a block square last year, great. You need to do more than that. What are you actually doing when no one is watching? And then as an LGBTQ affirming provider, are you collecting data on your sex, on sexual orientation and gender identity for survivors within your program? This can look like, what is your name? What are your pronouns? Educate yourself on what pronouns are. Do you identify within the LGBTQ plus community? Remove terms like homosexual from your paperwork. It is 2021 people. We don't need that term anymore. It's very triggering. So let's, let's remove it. Um, and what is the name that is most comfortable for you to utilize when speaking in person if it's different from the name on your paperwork? And when you safety plan with a client, because a lot of us are doing teletherapy work, can I use, a, use your name and pronouns when I'm talking to you um, when you're in your home? Or do I need to use the one that is on your paperwork so that I don't accidentally out you? Understand the history of sexual violence. When discussing abusers and perpetrators, don't assume the partner is of opposite sex of the client unless that is clear from the beginning. Throw away your assumptions of what a uh, sexual violence perpetrator can be. Evaluate your staff. Do you have providers on your team that identify within the LGBTQ plus community? This does not mean out your staff members. This just simply means, do you have people that say, oh yeah, this is my wife. I do it all the time. That they're affirming and that they are able to affirm their clients that are also in the community. And recognize again that the learning never stops. How burst is your agency in supporting survivors of sexual violence who have been assaulted by their same sex partners? Do you support survivors of gen one gender identity within your agency? And where do folks who are non-binary or mask presenting or male presenting fall in your work? And how can your work be more inclusive of survivors that are trans, non-binary, or male? And recognizing that for some LGBTQ plus survivors, if you're a religious provider, that, that may deter them from gaining your support. How can you make your, state, your space more safe for them when connecting in the community? And these are some books. These two slides I will send to um, Ali to send to everybody so that you can check out some books um, on your own if you would like to read more from survivors, from folks um, within these communities um, and how to navigate the world. And this is not all directly related to sexual violence. I think that is always great for you to um, acknowledge the experiences of individuals that are coming from these different communities to understand how they navigate the world. So with our five minutes left, I want to give time for folks to ask any questions that you have. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And if you have no questions, that's okay too. I will leave my contact information at the end of the training. Hi, Cheyenne. Hi, Joan. Hi, Josh. Hi, Gabby. All these people that I'm naming, I know. Some of you I don't know, but hi, everyone. Um, and to give a quick plug, if you like more trainings like this and to like to see more of our work, um, we have a directory called Nurture Forward where we train providers in order to be um, better supportive of trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation survivors. So our directory is created by us, led by survivors, and um, we often do these trainings and bring in survivor-led speakers in order to better inform you as a service provider, as a clinical provider. So feel free to reach out if you would like to learn more about our directory. This is my contact information. I'm going to put it in the chat box. And um, yeah, oh, I just sent it to one person, sorry. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate everyone having me. You guys have been 
awesome. Um, and I hope that the rest of your uh, panels and your discussions today go wonderfully. Thank you.